An engineer who wants to start a business using investment capital needs to understand the expectations of investors. The market for the business needs to be huge, the team needs to have a differentiated understanding of the market, or a differentiated product. The CEO needs to have the determination to continue operating the company even when things get very difficult, and the price needs to be right for the investor. Even if you're just working for a startup or considering joining a startup, you must understand how the investment market works. From a raw financial standpoint, it only makes sense to spend your time at a startup that has equity with a high expected value. Your equity will only have high expected value if the company continues to exist long enough to have an exit. The company must either go public or get acquired. In order to make it down the long and winding road to an exit, a technology company often needs to raise money on multiple occasions. That money is used to pay employees like you. If the company can't earn enough revenues or raise money, you're going to get fired, and then you may not have the spare cash to execute your stock options. You might lose the rights to the equity that you worked so hard for. The best way to avoid this is to learn to think like an investor. Because as an engineer working for equity, you might as well be an investor. Zamil Shah is an early-stage seed investor with Haystack, a fund that he created. He also works with GGV Capital, a venture firm investing out of the United States and China. Zamil has been blogging about technology for many years, and eventually he evolved from being just a commentator to an investor himself. In this episode, we explore the dynamics between investors and founders of early-stage technology companies. We also explore the strange market of podcasting. Samil worked at a company called Concept.io that built a podcasting app called Swell, and Concept was acquired by Apple for $30 million. We've done other great shows with engineering investors like Chris Dixon and Adrian Collier, and you can find these episodes by downloading the free Software Engineering Daily app for iOS or for Android. In the other podcast players, you can only access the most recent 100 episodes of Software Engineering Daily. With these apps, we are building a new way to consume content about software engineering. These apps are open sourced at github.com slash software engineering daily. If you're looking for an open source project to get involved with, we would love to get your help and bring you into the community. With that, I hope you enjoy this episode. Spring Framework gives developers an environment for building cloud-native projects. On December 4th through 7th, Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain driven design, and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud native software. Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a Spring One Platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at Spring One reporting on developments in the cloud native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me December 4th through 7th at the Spring One Platform conference. And use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Samil Shah is an investor who runs a fund called Haystack. He also is associated with the venture capital firm GGV. Samil, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. The reason I wanted to have you on the show is because you you write a lot about the intersection of software companies and investing, and I think you have a lot of advice that's useful for anybody who is in the ecosystem. And most of the people who are listening to the show are software engineers, but there are people in other categories. 
I, I think the show the show is going to be useful even to software engineers, and I want to start on a topic that will be particularly useful to software engineers, and that is your post that's called "The Market Ignores Inputs." And the the thesis of this post is that people often put lots of work into something, and they expect to be rewarded based on their inputs. But if this work doesn't produce outputs, it actually doesn't matter. And I found this relevant to me because I've started so many side projects that went absolutely nowhere. And then you don't get rewarded for those, even though they take a ton of input effort. And I think this can be particularly problematic for engineers because they get into a certain mental state and they're like, okay, this is a project that's going to save the world. I'm going to put a ton of work into it. And then it goes nowhere. How do you identify the right things to focus on that will lead to output rather than wasted input? Well, let, let me just clarify in that I, I meant that post from an investment context. And I think people who are creating something, whether they're baking in their kitchen or creating software for the, for the joy of creating software, like many of your audience members or people who like to paint in their free time, the joy of doing it should be the ultimate driver. I think when things, where things kind of get messed up or out of balance is when someone wants this external validation or they want it to work or they want investment for it or they want to sell their painting or, or start a, you know, a birthday cake business out of their kitchen and the market isn't there. And so the reason I wrote that post was just sort of a reminder. is like when you enter into that commercial world, the market necessarily won't care as much about the craft of how you got there. They'll, they'll start to care about what the output is. Is the birthday cake good? Does a painting work in my office or in my home? Does the software actually help me? Does, does the software do what I needed to do? And so the craft, the craftsmanship or that people put into it, and especially in the software engineering context, you know, that can be jarring for people. Now, in 2010 to 2013, you were more of a commentator than an investor, but you went through your own founding process as you made that shift from someone who was more of a, almost a journalist slash, you know, you were working at some startups, but you made your way to becoming an investor, and it was very deliberate. How did your writing change as you went from a mere commentator to an investor? Because throughout this whole process, you were an eloquent writer, and I think that was part of that was part of why you became a successful investor was because you were able to communicate your ideas clearly. But how did the creative process change as your external life changed? There were um, maybe two or three things that changed. So. One is just the writing is sort of this reflection of what you experience in your environment on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe when I was working at startups and, you know, working on mobile app creation, mobile distribution, mobile marketing, that's what I'd be writing about. How do you take what's coming out of the new iOS update and use it to your advantage? How can you use Bluetooth low energy to your advantage? And then as I started to, like work on professionalizing my investment activity, I spend more time with LPs, learning their business model. I started to learn more about fund management. I started to learn about how larger funds manage their funds, and so that would be reflected in the writing. So I'd say that's kind of a gradual shift of like, you know, kind of that, this quote, like we covet what we see on a daily basis, right? We're sort of creatures of proximity. Mm. So that's more of a general comment. I would say a specific comment of something that changed was that I noticed in 2015 or so, you know, I'm very fortunate that a lot of people in the ecosystem read and share what I write. And I think I just, I, I write in a way that I would be speaking to you now, hopefully, which is, which is accessible and, and sort of to the point. I started to notice that some people or, or quite a few people in the ecosystem would ascribe even more weight to the words I was writing than I had thought of. And that when you do pair the power of the written word and the tone with money and influence, I have to be a little more careful in what I say. Hmm. Partially because it is a very privileged role to be in, that you're an allocator of capital and people are entrusting you to allocate it. 
but also because people may take what you're saying and hundred X the weight to it and you can't control that. Hmm. And so if you think about some of the investors who are the most experienced, most successful in the world in venture, they either don't speak often or when they do, they're pretty careful about what they say because I think they know intuitively that people are going to hang on their words. Yeah, it's, I mean, especially in today's environment where it seems like there everybody has a heightened sense of awareness and people are some people are just waiting to take things out of context and blow it out of proportion. But at the same time there's value in taking some risks in what you say and being willing to say things that other people might not uh, be able to say. I'm I'm pretty lucky there because I'm uh you know have one person employed in my fund full time and that's me. I think a lot of other people at funds depending on the fund, they may or may not want to say certain things because it then reflects on their partners. And so they have to take that into consideration. Hmm. Now, last year you wrote that you were going to need to learn some harsh lessons as an investor before you felt more seasoned. So uh, since last year, have you learned any of those harsh lessons? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the, the harsh lessons around raising a fund a professional fund and the aggregating of capital from institutional sources. It's, it's a really hard thing to do. And then I think the, the harsher lessons around like what the outputs are again, like no one at the end of the day is going to care about, you know, why did you do this deal or how did you help out this company or, you know, they want you to be helpful. They want you to be thoughtful in investing, but really the outcomes are so random and and so hard to control that the re- you know, the results in that investment context like are going to be harsh, right? You're going to go through some harsh times because you don't you don't have control over the outcome. Do you have any examples of harsh lessons? On the fundraising side, sure. I mean, it, you know, I thought I would raise an institutional fund for my third fund, and only got to my fourth fund when I had to like learn all the lessons from raising fund three that I applied to fund four. I would say in investment context, I haven't really had the harsh lesson yet, although I'm sure I will. Uh, I think it'll relate to like ownership and multiple of like when you're early in a great company, but you don't have enough capital or awareness to like keep investing or maintain a position. Mm. You can get really diluted. And so you may think the initial money you put in is worth this, but when you start doing the math and the waterfall, it can decompress pretty quickly. Well, this is something that I've heard you talk about in some of your interviews where one of the really important things to understand in the investing environment is that investors, they want, they don't want to just put in money in one round because you hear about these different rounds. There's like the angel round and then the, or the friends and family round before that. And then the seed round after the angel round and then the series A round after that, then the series B round. And the earlier investors want to be able to follow on their investments with further capital. So from the early investor's point of view, in order to follow on with additional capital, they actually have to hold some capital in reserves. So it kind of becomes a bankroll management problem for somebody who's managing a fund. You know, if, if you're looking at all of these interesting deals that are coming in at the at the seed stage, you constantly have to be thinking, okay, I could do this deal, but then am I going to be able to make my follow-on bet in HashiCorp or whatever when they're raising their Series A? Am I describing things accurately? No, it's true. I mean, let's, l- let me share with you how I think funds do it. The larger fund that you have, the more capital under management in a vehicle, the more pressure there is to generate a return. So it's not a, it's a, it's kind of a logarithmic thing. So if you have a $100 million fund and you want to generate a 3x net return, you've got to take that $100 million and turn it into $400 million. If it's $200 million, you've got to do that. You've got to turn it into $800 million. The problem is turning 1 into 4 versus 2 into 8 is just exponentially harder. And so what happens is, is these funds accumulate capital and earn fees off the capital, right? which there's a whole perverse incentive there we can talk about. They end up needing to put a lot of money behind the one or two big companies. And so they don't often know. And so there's a scramble to figure out, okay, I've invested in these 25 companies. How do I pick one or two? 
as like the main horse to put the money in. Oftentimes then there'll be a tussle with the founder and the early investors who may want to continue to follow on. And then there's all these provisions that I don't even fully understand that come aboard, like preference stacking and who gets paid back first in the event of a sale and all this kind of stuff. So usually the last money in and the largest checks have a lot more say over people even being early. And as an investor, how important is it to understand those dynamics relative to picking the right company? Is HashiCorp going to be a great investment? Is Instacart going to be a great investment? Are those things actually as important as understanding the investment dynamics? Let's step back. I believe like in the kind of 80-20 rule. And I think that there are a couple points decision points that come along for an investor that you apply the 80-20 rule to. If you're lucky enough to see 80% of the good deals, even if you don't pick or win them all, that's better than just seeing, you know, that's better. Th- that's a good place to be. Then out of the deals that you pick, if 80, you know, 80-20, if just 20% seem to like that they're moving in a good direction, that's a great place to be, right? Because most things don't work out. Once you then have identified that 20% that's working out, how do you allocate the next 80-20 rule to the right ones? And I think that's very difficult because you don't, you don't really know. You know, if people knew this, they would have put more money into Airbnb earlier. Now, it was just only five years ago, I think, that Andreessen did that round valued at a billion, right? It was only five years ago. So... I just tend to think even at the Series B round, when someone's writing a $10 to $30 million check, even the VCs writing that check don't know the shape of the company. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is that you can start, if you, if you start to believe very early as the investor that this is the one, but you've picked the wrong one out of that 20%, you know, you could lose a lot of money real quickly. At Software Engineering Daily, we need to keep our metrics reliable. If a botnet started listening to all of our episodes and we had nothing to stop it, our statistics would be corrupted. We would have no way to know whether a listen came from a bot or a real user. And that's why we use Encapsula, to stop attackers and improve performance. When a listener makes a request to play an episode of Software Engineering Daily, Encapsula checks that request before it reaches our servers, and it filters the bot traffic preventing it from ever reaching us. Botnets and DDoS attacks are not just a threat to podcasts. They can impact your application too. Encapsula can protect API servers and microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula for yourself, go to encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts and get a free enterprise trial of Encapsula. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application, and that's true whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, like Software Engineering Daily. Encapsula has a global network of over 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers are filtering your content for attackers, and they're operating as a CDN, and they're speeding up your application they're doing all of this for you, and you can try it today for free by going to Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts, and you can get that free enterprise trial of Encapsula. That's Encapsula.com slash 2017 podcasts to check it out. Thanks again, Encapsula. Well, when we are talking about the picking every seed investor is different and that's about the stage that you invest in you you consider it seed right the investments you make out of haystack i chop yes i chop seed into four categories where there's pre-seed there's seed there's a second seed or extension and then there's post-seed hmm. and now what i tell entrepreneurs is let's say jeff you and i start a company we may have to go through one, two, three, or all four of those checkpoints before we raise an institutional grade round. 
Right. Okay. And uh, yeah. And for more on this, we we had Paul Martino on recently, who you actually introduced me to. He's an awesome guy. He was a really entertaining show too. So, but that one was great. He does post seed, so he's got a very specific way that he looks at the market. And I think part of the reason that the investment market broke down into these different sub components of seed was the amount of deals that were coming into the ecosystem. But when we're talking about picking, you know, whatever, wherever you put yourself in the investment landscape, you know, you could be an angel investor, you could be a seed investor. If you've got a ton of money, you could be a Series A or a Series B or a you know, Series C type of investor, growth stage. You've, you've got different parameters and you've got different ideas for how you see the world. And a big component, whatever the deal is, is is going to be the founder and looking at the founder and talking to the founder and examining whether you believe the founder and the founder's business is important. We had a show with Leo Polovets recently, who you also are acquainted with. And one thing that really stood out in that interview to me was Leo's mention of charisma and the idea that with you know, when you're putting money into an investment, an early stage tech company investment, charisma is super important because you need a founder who is going to be able to lead people. How important is charisma to you? So a couple of things um, in reverse order. Leo is a good friend and someone I love co-investing with. He might have gotten that from one of my tweets. <laughs> I, I, tw- I think I remember tweeting out a couple of years ago the same insight, which is like, the charisma needed just to evangelize your idea. People don't like that word because they think of charisma with a little bit of a negative connotation, like, hey, you're trying to sell me or you're slicking back your hair and you know, selling me a toaster. I think of charisma as like organic uh, evangelism and that the pitch, when somebody's pitching Leo, if Leo can use that pitch as a proxy to say, well, how is this person going to recruit their 10th engineer and how is this person going to get a partnership with Pepsi and how is this person going to show up on um, a a profile in USA Today and if the charisma is real it's really powerful and so so I do think it's important Paul who you mentioned earlier Paul someone I'm lucky that I worked with for a few years you know basically saw him discover this post-seed model which he's really nailed and like so far ahead of a lot of other people so I can't wait to listen to that one yeah, he's a very entertaining person. I talk about charisma. That guy is charismatic. Well, Paul is Paul is deeply loyal person. Is one of the most loyal people I've met in venture, and he's very intellectually honest and data driven, and not afraid to say how he interprets the data. Mm-hmm. And he's very yeah. consistent. It makes him special. Another crucial component of a business at any stage is the idea of a moat. How important is a moat in an early stage technology company? I don't know if it's easy to tell early what the moat will be. The moat could be some kind of technology advantage that an entrepreneur brings to the table. It could be a series of beliefs around winning a market and that network effect being a moat. I know Leo really likes to invest in things that could have a moat. I'm not sure if you can determine that early. I certainly think when you're writing a five to ten million dollar check you have to think about just generally defensibility of the investment and a moat is one way to defend defend an investment but not the only way Hmm. have you seen any examples of tech companies that died because their moat was too shallow their moat was too shallow like the business was not defensible enough and some other clone business was able to i think we're going to see that in storage so consumer storage, enterprise storage, I don't really know what moats you know, the players have. I think they've turned them into great businesses and built great technologies. It's not clear, it's not clear to me yet how defensible those are going to be long term. You mean like the, you're talking about like the Dropbox or the Box type of businesses? Correct. Yeah. What about user interface? You don't think user interface is a moat? I don't. So, quote from Paul Graham. Startups die from suicide, not murder. How true do you think that is? Well, it's sort of, you know, I, I think I remember another quote of his, which is suicide, not murder. Huh? I think I mostly agree. I think that if people, 
there's there's certainly exceptions, but if people running a company, even if they have to make really hard changes, there's always a way out. And I think at the very, very end, having been around some companies that just, the end comes really quick and people can kind of freeze up. Mm. And, and also people may not want to go through it. So, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. But yeah, I would say directionally he's probably right. Mm. Yeah, I guess I should have given more context around why I mentioned that quote is because, you know, I think the idea that your company may not have a moat, well, if you if you let's say you build a consumer storage company, like you build a Dropbox, you get a bunch of users, they're using your product, you've already got a cash cow, you've got a, a strong team in place. Theoretically, you should be able to build new products. You should be able to take that team and do new things. And you know, if you're not able to, you know, maybe you could classify that as a suicide rather than rather than a murder. You know, because you're not dying due to competitors; you're dying because you can't well, figure out a new product to build. I think Paul, kind of what Paul. I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but what he may be implying too is that sometimes, you know, he he has a great line where he kind of says like. I'm paraphrasing, but once he starts to hear long excuses, he knows that the company is going to die. Mm. It's this kind of ownership over the agency of the enterprise, which is it can kind of be in our own personas and our own behavior to kind of ascribe blame to outside sources. You know, hey, we couldn't make it there because this company just got funded with 50 million. And hey, we couldn't get there because we couldn't just hire in this environment. And you know, hey, you know, the company didn't work because, you know, the sales cycles were too long. And that is an externalization, assigning blame externally. And I think what's healthy is to recognize those external things, but also think about internally, okay, what could I have done? And so again, no one wants to kind of sit on somebody when they're, you know, trying to pick themselves up from falling down. Uh, so, So maybe those conversations don't happen as they should. Well, whether it's by suicide or murder, startups do fail. Projects fail. Uh, And when companies fail, it's often with a whimper rather than a bang. It's often a slow, painful death rather than like a sudden shutdown. And when that happens, it's up to the founders to wind down a business properly and to get aqua hired or to sell the technology at a loss. And this is a bummer of a process, but it's it's really important if you're a technology founder and your business isn't working and you have investors, particularly when you have investors, you have to wind down your business properly. And you've written about this a little bit in order to maintain your integrity and your reputation. What are some tips for winding down a faltering business gracefully? You know, I think talk to the lawyers that you have. Make sure that the people who worked with you and or gave you money or and or that are your customers, like your constituents, so to speak, understand what's going to happen and are communicated with clearly and try your best to create an outcome you know, even that means like three to six months of trying to sell the company or quote, land the plane. Mm. You know, I think that's the noble thing to do. I think a lot of people do it. I think a lot of people just kind of throw in the towel, don't communicate, don't try to sell the company. And especially in the Bay Area, that's happening more and more because they can just roll off and start their new company. And that to me just isn't the right thing to do. And it's not a healthy thing ecosystem wise as well. So the outcome that we obviously are rooting for with a company is not a slow and painful death, but rather a merger or an acquisition or going public. But let's talk about M&A. It's 2017. What are the themes that are going on in M&A in technology companies? If you talk to LPs who monitor this stuff very closely, there's not as much M&A happening, so you don't see the Googles and the Facebooks of the world spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars as they may be used to five to ten years ago. I think where you are seeing M&A happen are correlated in industries that there's some inherent fear bubbling within the industry. So retail, you know, physical retail being one, uh, where you see Jet, sorry, Walmart, you know, Unilever these kind of companies making spending a lot of cash to buy new teams and products another one obviously would be automotive just how 
transportation vehicles are going to be redesigned. That seems like another huge one where there's fear bubbling up and a lot of talented people and a lot of money rushing into it. So I'd say those two are the ones that stand out. The third one, which I've bet a lot of my time on, is in industrial automation. And this idea of like how is all the software and the prototyping and the parts at the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins, the Raytheons, the, the Caterpillars of the world, how is that going to change? And so that, that's another area that I think is uh, fertile. Okay, so I'll take that and run with it. What are the places where we're going to see significant change in industrial automation? The way I would, the way I would simplify it is think of, think of Boeing and, you know, they're in the, you know, big piece of their business is aviation. And, and think of them building an, en- an engine for, for a new airliner. Now, how did they do that 30 years ago in terms of the software to design it, the way to prototype it, and the actual materials and to use to build it? If you fast forward to today, I would argue all the software, all the way down to the actual material science of how those things are being built, prototyped, assembled, mass produced is going to change and is changing. And so can you invest in the in the entrepreneurs and the creators who are accelerating that change? Are there companies, tech companies that are started, you know, in in 2017 when you're looking out at the landscape that seem like they're started just to get acquired where they don't have a plan other than an acquisition? It's not often discussed, but a lot of them are. I mean, you could argue um, a lot of the technology startups being sort of spawned in the autonomous vehicle space, they're not going to go public. They're not going to have a, a SaaS business model. So they're being built to be acquired. I think the entrepreneurs and the investors in those cases are implicitly saying, we suspect that the industry will consolidate talent and technology so rapidly, like actually just today, Delphi bought Newtonomy mm-hmm. out of Boston for $400 million. Yep. So they're betting on that. It's just not something that people like to talk about because it's a different kind of bet that sort of runs counter to this idea of company building and, and sort of maintaining independence. And so, you know, it's just kind of one of those things that you people may be thinking but aren't, aren't verbalizing. Do you have a product that is sold to software engineers? Are you looking to hire software engineers? Become a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily and support the show while getting your company into the ears of 24,000 developers around the world. Developers listen to Software Engineering Daily to find out about the latest strategies and tools for building software. Send me an email to find out more, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. The sponsors of Software Engineering Daily make this show possible, and I have enjoyed advertising for some of the brands that I personally love using in my software projects. If you're curious about becoming a sponsor, send me an email, or email your marketing director and tell them that they should send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Thanks, as always, for listening and supporting the show, and let's get on with the show. And do you do you pass judgment on that, or do you see that as subjectively negative yourself? Because when I look at that, I'm like, okay, well, you know, if I wanted to go into, there are plenty of people who want to go into self driving, right? They want to prevent people from dying. This is like the first place where robotics are really going to hit the consumer, arguably. Uh, and if you wanted to enter this market and you wanted to play around in it as an engineer. Well, arguably the most monetarily successful way to do that is to start a company that will get acquired today. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think so. I mean, as you know, I don't have religion around it. I think, you know, I think again, if we go back to like, is the intent pure around what the person is creating? Are they technically capable of pulling it off? And will other people support that organic vision? I mean, I think you saw that in Cruise, right? I think when Nabil made the Series A bet in Cruise, he probably wasn't sitting there thinking, well, how is this going to make money? I think he's just like had a lot of faith in the team that they were going to create something that other people will want. 
and you know everyone was rewarded for that decision. But I don't think a lot of investors would have made that decision. Mm. So they should get extra, extra credit for, for doing so. When that sizable M&A event takes place, when there's an acquisition, what is the role of the investors in that transaction? Are the investors helping to negotiate for the most profitable acquisition? I haven't been around too many of them. I think it really depends. I would say if it's good investors and a good you know, set of potential bidders, yes, I think they're helping the founders you know, negotiate because on the margin, some of these outcomes could, could change quite materially. So you were part of a company called Concept.io that built a podcasting product. Got to ask you a little bit about this. Explain what you were building at Concept.io. Yeah, so I wrote a post on this um, sort of on TechCrunch, which is, which is a weekend post called Threading the Needle on Mobile. And essentially, the founder who had this insight was kind of thinking, how can I build a background service that isn't going to take attention away from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that with Bluetooth now taking off, you can start using it in the car and make it feel more like radio so you can listen to Pandora as a lean back experience and you don't have to interact with it too much. How can we do that for audio? And so I just love the idea, you know, help them start the company and then I joined like maybe six months later, maybe a year later, I can't remember. I used a product like 20 to 30 hours a week so when it when it was eventually acquired and then sunset, it was a big hit. But yeah, it was just a really fun experience. I mean, just the people there was just fun. Really enjoyed the people. There was a lot of simplicity in the design. What I loved about it is like, you know, I love to watch Meet the Press or listen to Meet the Press every week. And I knew every like Sunday night or Monday when I would hit swell, I would get my regular update and then maybe like a eight minute update and then boom it would go right into meet the press and so it learned very quickly my preferences yeah and so that was kind of the idea is like if you're in pandora and you want to switch over to am radio what would that experience be like right so the company was called concept.io it built this product called swell and swell was sort of a recommendation system for podcasts now if you think about that experience relative to the podcast world today it almost sounds like we've taken a step back from the swell world because, you know, today it's still very much subscribe individually to the same podcast. Like podcasting is like the same as it was 10 years ago. Why is that? Why, what are the problems with the podcast market that keep it so stagnant? There, there are two main things. I'm glad you asked this question today because I just had this conversation a week ago and, and was able to crystallize an answer. And they're, they're unrelated. One is that the technology that underpins the creation and distribution of podcasts as RSS feed is not sufficient enough anymore. And so somebody needs to create the next one. Now people are trying to do that by having original content built through the, you know, built through the iPhone and record through the iPhone. But there's just a fundamental problem of using RSS. I think the second one is a market problem where, you know, I always give this trick question to people, which is what's the most influential podcast company in the world? And it's Apple. And Apple, and I don't blame them for it, you know, probably aren't super interested in the five to ten billion dollar audio market. And so they haven't put a lot of resources into into the podcast player. I mean only it's only been in the last couple of years where they've added it to your phone as part of a preload versus having to go download it. So when you, when you enter into this world where the underlying technology and distribution of it isn't optimal, plus you have a 8,000 pound gorilla in the room that doesn't view it as a priority, you end up in this world of like iTunes when everyone else is in Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. I think that's where podcasts are. I would say the final thing is like audio and what we're doing in this video, like this, this interview, even though it's a great interview, audio just not, isn't viral. And, and so, you know, there's an inherent limitation to the virality and the ability to share the medium. That's just different than video. It's different than written content. Indeed. Now, the company that acquired Concept.io was Apple. Why did they acquire it if they had this level of disinterest? Well, I don't want to say their disinterest is long term. I think that they were very interested in the design team that Concept.io had built and the collaborative filtering algorithms and the classifier 
system that they built and also streaming from server to different devices. So that's a technology they'll want to use in, in Apple Music as well. Some people believe that the podcasting market is so interesting and exciting because it is broken. To what degree do you think that's true? I normally would agree that that's true, except for the three reasons I mentioned. I think it's not true. <laughs> I think it's, it's not exciting from an entrepreneurial point of view or an investment point of view because of that. I think it's exciting in a creation point of view because now you can open up Anchor or Breaker and record a podcast and then distribute it. How can it be that we have this entertainment medium that people spend two to four hours a day consuming, and yet there does not seem to be an opportunity for a profitable business. Well, I think Marco's app is profitable. Mm, right. So Marco should get a lot of credit. Um, Overcast. Yeah, I mean, he's a great product designer, engineer, thinker. I think that's pretty, pretty obvious. Look, I think the information is free. The content is free. It's not premium. I also think it's part of a of a stool, like a three or four legged st stool for media entities. So that you have your blog, you have your podcast, you might have a video series, you might have a conference. It's not the thing that makes money. I think it's the way to create an intimate bond with a part of your audience. I want to come back to investing and startups and one thing I like to discuss with investors is the role of human psychology, because this is important both as an investor, you're managing your own psychology, and when you're examining founders for whether they're going to be able to build a business or not, you need to know if they're going to have the psychological fortitude to execute on a business properly. What have you learned about human psychology as an investor? It's a huge piece of what I do, which is to dissect, unpack, investigate, and determine the entrepreneurial drive of somebody that I'm curious about investing in. Because you have to assume that there's going to be competition in what they're doing in some way, and you have to assume that a number of things that they want to do aren't going to work out. And so what is motivating that person all the way back to how, how they were raised and what values they were taught to how, how they conduct themselves in the, in the what could be the most meaningless way of like, do you hold the door? Do you tip well? Do you, you know, all these little things, these little tells, I think are super important in assessing, at least for me, who I want to work with. So are there instances that come to mind when there's some founder you're talking to about a technology startup and it's a plausible business. The founder seems qualified, but based off of some psychological giveaway, you decide not to invest? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't get it right all the time, but I try to think about it. And yes, I, I do. For me, it's just I want the investment I made to be successful. And the way to have it to have a chance to be successful is to build a team and the way somebody builds a team is to recruit and to like bring people on board who are going to who are going to want to work in a certain way and so if people are very cavalier about how they raise a round or like how knowledgeable they are to me that that same proxy is going to show up when they're trying to recruit somebody great so as we said it's 2017 and you've got this multi-stage seed investment environment it's kind of complicated for some founders to understand how have the expectations of seed investors changed in the last year and last last few years and and how does that stand today what are seed investors looking for in a startup oh i'll take this so mike michael deering just did a um interview on 20 minute vc where i thought he had a great frame for this. He essentially said the seed market has bifurcated into two very different markets. There's a class of seed investors that have professional LPs. They invest in packs or like with a set number of people. They do price rounds. They don't overinvest in the companies. They try to engage in the company building and then they try to take the companies downstream for more financing. There's another part of the market on the other side 
that's writing smaller checks, it's all convertible notes, it's really high caps or uncapped, and you know, it's completely without discipline. And so I think the I think Michael's right that the scene market has bifurcated that way. And then there's also just a lot more funds out there. So there's a lot of seed capital in the Bay Area. Hmm. And so what you end up happening on one side, you have people trying to get more ownership and raise slightly larger funds. And then you have a bunch of other people who are trying to just associate themselves with good companies and just thinking in an upside context like, Hey, if this works out, this will be great. How much help should a founder expect to get from an investor? I mean, this really just depends. You know, there's there's so many um, philosophies trapped behind this. I mean, I tend to think I want to invest in people that don't want my help, right? Just they already know what they want to do. I think you have to be open to being coached a little bit when things aren't working right. But if an entrepreneur generally has a lead or co-lead investor, I think the first test to apply is like the do no harm test. Like, will this person through references, like not through their own action, be harmful? Because sometimes people just by trying to be helpful can be harmful. I think after that, it's kind of a bonus if somebody can can really help out beyond just going to the board meetings or getting updates or being a little more proactive. And that usually is a function of their ownership as well. So if you give a few investors ownership in your company and you reference them properly, most likely they're going to help. If you raise a million bucks from 40 different people and they don't feel like they know you or have ownership in the deal, you may not hear from a lot of them. The next stage after a seed round is a company raises a Series A round. It's frequently the next step, at least. And there was something called the Series A crunch where companies started having a lot of trouble going from the seed round to the Series A round. Why did the Series A crunch manifest? I I think people still think it's manifesting. I think there's just, you know, since 2010, probably more and more seed capital, more and more companies, and not enough people to write five to $10 million checks that are qualified to do so. And so you have this thing which people call like a pig and a python, right? You have the python, which is this the investment market for people to write five to $10 million checks and take ownership. And then you have this pig, which is essentially the rolled up version of all these seed companies. And literally you're trying to pass it through. It's kind of an old saying, but I think it's like worth the illustration. It's just difficult. There's just not enough room. So company raises a seed round of one to 2 million. And then 18 months later, they're running out of money. They've got seven to 10 employees and they can't raise their series a round they don't have the metrics they don't have the users they have something but they can't they just can't they haven't been able to make it work yet what do they often do in that situation well there's so much capital in the market now that they can go back to those four slices i was talking about they can do a second seed they can do a post seed but you know i think what's rewarded in venture capital is growth over you know, somewhat short period of time. And the more that a company's kind of hanging around and not growing, it's sort of like a carton of milk, right? You start to turn it around and check the expiry date. I had a founder that I backed who's really, really nice guy, very talented, single founder, hired a couple people, raised like a $1.7 million seed round because he's very talented. And he told me something recently because he's thinking of like letting go of the business five years into it, he just said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he said he didn't realize that he wasn't going to be rewarded for spending the money wisely over a five-year period. Like the investment market rewards growth and like team building and vision. And Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think like, oh, well, there's just not enough capital sources. There's plenty of capital. It's the market's more efficient than people would want. It's just there's not enough things growing enough to meet that demand. So you write that the Series A process is a business role-play game where the VC is evaluating the interaction with the founder as a proxy for how the founder would interact in different business environments. So if there are these, some, you know, there's obviously some companies that are growing fast enough that they're worthy of a Series A. So can you describe the process that, what is a VC looking for? What are they dissecting when they're deciding 
whether a Series A opportunity is worth investing in, going from the seed round to a Series A? They're talking to lots of customers. They're trying to understand the market dynamic. They're trying to underwrite, you know, at minimum a 10x return. So if we do a $10 million round at a, at a 50 post, can we see a great company buying this company for $500 million or more? They're spending time with the executive team. They're trying to get customers for the teams to see how, again, more role-playing, how the team reacts and how the customers react to the team. They're looking for personal chemistry, like, hey, do I want to show up on a board with this person and then this investor, existing investor? So those, those are kind of the pressure tests that people apply to a potential deal. I mean, I'm simplifying a more complex process, but that's generally what, what the shape of it is. All right, Samil. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been great talking to you about investing and startups and technology companies. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was great. Simplify continuous delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines, and visualize them end-to-end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow!